module focuses on the 19th century Victorian period. In particular, we will look at four different periods, the, re the Directoire period, the Romantic period, the Crinoline period, and the Bustle period and the 90s. The first section focuses on the Directoire period. Women wore the chemise, which was cut full till the knees short satin sleeves with gussets under the arms and low square necklines in white cotton or linen material. Corsets or stays were worn over the chemise. They were cut in straight lines without the emphasis on the waist but pushed the breast up and out. Drawers and petticoats were also part of underwear. Pantalets were long straight white drawers trimmed with rows of lace and tucked at the hem. Bustle-like padded rolls were placed under the dress at the back of the waistline to give a forward slant to the body or the Grecian bend. Dresses had tubular shape with waist placement below the bust or the empire line. The skirts reached to the floor, the backs were gathered or pleated. Dresses that opened at the front displayed elaborately decorated petticoats worn especially for evening wear. Dresses for daytime did not open up at the front and were called round gowns. Outer bodice closed in front either by wrapping it across the bosom like a shawl or lacing it up over a short undershirt called a habit shirt. Necklines were low, square and round or oval. Higher necklines finished in ruffles or ruffs with a drawstring. Sleeves were short, puffed or fitted, long or full. In the empire period, Pastel shades with delicate embroideries were seen, while for outdoors, shawls over dresses, stoles, cloaks and capes were used. The Murray sleeve was another variation of the Virago sleeve. The dress styles were inspired from Grecian and Roman statues discovered at the time. The faded nature of these statues was misinterpreted, supposing that Ro Romans and Greeks wore only white. The Spencer coat was a short jacket that ended at the waist or just below the bust with or without sleeves. The jacket was usually in contrasting color to the dress. The pelisse was a full length dress in an empire silhouette. There were many different kinds of headdress. Greek prototypes were popular. The hair was combed back and gathered in ringlets or coils around the face in soft curls. Jockey caps and turbans were also worn. Footwear. Flat shoes were worn. Crisscross lacing ran up the leg. Short boots that reached to the calves and patterns for bad weather. Accessories included long gloves till the upper arms, reticules or indispensables. These were small handbags with drawstrings. Also used were muffs, parasols, fans and handkerchiefs. Jewelry included necklaces, earrings, rings, small watches, brooches and bracelets that were worn high on the arm. Torques were high brimless hats, gypsy hats with low crowns and moderately wide brims tied with ribbons over the cap and under the chin. Day caps were lace caps. Hats were worn for formal social events. For men, wore drawers. Shirts were cut full with band collars reaching to the cheek. The front of the shirt is usually pleated or ruffled. Cravats and stocks were worn. Waistcoats were made of lining material. Collars were stiff and high. About two inches of the waistcoat was visible when the coat was closed. Breeches and trousers that ended at the knee were worn. Pantaloons fitted the leg closer than the trouser with an instep strap. Overcoats, greatcoats, full, single or double-breasted knee or full length were worn for outdoors. Some coats had collars or cap sleeves. Cloaks were not fashionable but worn for travel. Dressing gowns or banyans were ankle length cut with full flared skirt with matching waistcoats. Men preferred short hair and clean shaven faces with long side whiskers or sideburns. Top hats and bicorn, chapeau bros were worn. Shoes had rounded toes and heels. Military boots became famous after officials like Napoleon, Wellington's, Bl Bluchers, Cossacks and Hessians. 
boots were high at the front and scooped below the knee, at the back for ease in movement. Short boots were worn under close-fitting trousers. The main accessories used were gloves, quizzing glasses, rings, watch, fobs and brooches. Let's move on to the Romantic period. The main sources of information on this period are women's magazines, Gordy's ladies books, Peterson's magazines, fashion plates and photographic portraiture. Women wore skirts that were wide with bustles at the back. Undergarments worn were drawers, chemise, stays, corsets, petticoats were part of undergarments. The main emphasis on clothing was the small waist. For elite women, costumes were designed and made for different times and activities of the day like morning dress, day dress, carriage dress, walking dress, etc. The morning dress was an informal lingerie type dress. Bodices had a wide V-shaped revers extending from shoulder to waist in the front and back. Wide cape-like collars were worn. Sleeve designs were diverse. Sleeves were puffed at the shoulder and then attached to a long fitted sleeve till the wrist. Decorative appulets or mancherons were used. Gigo or lego mutton and demi gigo was worn. Embecile or the idiot sleeve was also worn. Waistline design remained straight with buckled belts and sashes. Skirt lengths kept changing. The pelisse robe was a dress for daytime. Chemisette or tuckers, these were raised necklines of daytime dresses. Pelerines, these were white cape-like collars that extended over the shoulders and across the bosom. Fichu pelerine, these had two wide panels or lapels extending down the front of the dress and passed under the belt. Santan was a silk cravat worn over a ruff. Canizan, a small sleeveless Spencer coat. Gillette corsage is a coat like a man's waistcoat. Most sleeves were set low, off the shoulders. Bishop sleeves. These were made with a row of vertical pleats at the shoulders, then released into a soft full sleeved, gathered to fit a cuff at the wrist. Sleeve and bouffant, alternated places of tightness and puffed out expanse. Victoria was a variation of a sleeve and bouffant and had a puff at the elbow. Tight sleeves with decorated frill over the elbow. Pockets were provided in skirts. Skirts were full, gathered into the waist. Trimmings included ruching, flounces, scallops and cording. Bertha collar was worn. Mantle variations like mantlet, pelerine mantlet, burnouns, paletot and pardesis were worn. The hair was parted at the center with light curls around the forehead temples. A bun at the back was favored. False plates and hair along with hair ornaments were used. Day caps included the capote bonnet. This was a soft crown with stiff brim. For footwear, stockings were knitted in cotton and silk. For evenings, black stockings became fashionable. Most shoes were the slipper type with very small heels. In cold weather, women wore leather shoes or boots with cold cloth gaiters, a covering for the upper part of the shoe and ankle. Rubber galoshes were introduced to protect the shoes. Hand accessories included reticules, purses, fans, muffs and parasols. Short gloves during the day and long ones for the evenings were worn. Jewelry included long gold chains that were worn with lockets, scent bottles or crosses were often attached. Chatelaines were ornamental chains worn at the waist from which useful items like scissors, thimbles, button hooks and pen knives were attached. A narrow piece of ribbon called genet was used to suspend a cross, heart or pearls around the neck. Men wore shirts that had deep collars which could be folded over a cravat or neck cloth. Daytime shirts had tucked insets at the front. Insets for evening shirts had frills. Sleeves were cuffed closed with buttons or studs. 
with shirt stocks, wide shaped neck pieces fastening at the back that were often b black, or cravats, square cloths folded diagonally into long strips and tied around the neck, finishing in a bow or knot. Coat, waistcoat, and trousers were components to a suit. Tailcoats and frock coats were the most common, common kinds of coats. Riding co coats had exceptionally large collars and lapels. Waistcoats were often worn in layers in different colors. Each layer was slightly shorter than the one worn inside to showcase multiple layers of waistcoats. Trousers worn with a suit were of a different color or sometimes a different shade. Until now, the sleeves were cut full at the armhole and after 1840, the sleeves were cut more narrow to fit the armhole without any gathers. Men's coats were padded in the shoulder and chest areas. Men sometimes wore a corset to achieve a fashionable V-shape. Waistcoats lengthened and developed a point at the front. Lapels were narrow and were less curved. Breeches were limited to sportswear. Fly front closures replaced fall closures for trousers. Dressing gowns were worn at home. They were made in vivid colors. Other clothing included great coats, which is a general term for overcoats that could be single or double-breasted and often reached the ankles. Box coat. These were large, loose great coats with one or more cape at the shoulder. Chesterfield. A double-breasted collar coat with or without a waistline seam. A short vent in the back, no side pleats and a velvet collar. A Macintosh was a waterproof coat made of rubber and cut like a short, loose overcoat. Cloaks were used for evening dress, cut with gores and fitting smoothly at the neck and shoulders. They had both large, flat and semi-standing collars. Men wore their hair in loose curls or loosely waved, short to moderate in length, cut short at the back. Beards, beginning with a small fringe of whiskers, returned to fashion. The top hat was a prominent style for day and evening. Other popular hats were the gibbous hats, collapsible top hats for ease of carrying around, and derby or bowler hats for sporting events. Stockings were worn. Shoes had square toes and low heels. A style with shoelaces in the front became popular. Formal footwear was open over the instep and tied shut with a ribbon bow. Rubber soles, rubber overshoes, galoshes, and elastic-sided shoes were available. Bedroom slippers were worn at home. Spatterdashers were gaiters made of stiff material, used for bad weather, sports, and hunting. Gloves made of leather, silk, or wool, snuff boxes, handkerchiefs, canes, and umbrellas were used. For jewelry, cravat pins, brooches, worn on shirt fronts, watches, jeweled shirt buttons, studs, Decorative gold watch chains and watches were worn. On to the crinoline period. Charles Frederick Worth started the first French couture house. Levi Strauss developed the Levi's jeans for the miners in America. The development of the sewing machine made clothes manufacturing less laborious. Early attempts at costume reform for women resulted in the bloomer. Many collections of costumes have survived from this period. The practice of photography also gives a wealth of information about how people want it to be seen. Paintings and fashion plates give detailed description of proposed styles. Women wore the chemise. This was short-sleeved and knee-length. Drawers were knee-length and trimmed at the hem with lace, ruffles or embroidery. The corset had lesser whalebone and more gussets and elastic. It became tighter and shorter as the crinoline became fashionable. A corset cover was worn. Petticoats went over the hoop and later the crinoline. Cage crinolines were used to reduce the weight of the skirts while still maintaining a fashionable silhouette. Gowns and separates were worn. Sleeves were placed low on the shoulder and styles ranged from bishop, pagoda, bell, engagements and layered ruffled sleeves. A red blouse called Garibaldi also became popular. Skirts were wide in this period, sometimes reaching up to 15 feet in diameter. 
For the outdoors, sleeves, unfitted and fitted coats of varying lengths were worn. Sleeveless loose capes, cloaks and shawls were used. Other costumes worn by women were pelletot. This was a sleeved fitted outdoor garment. Pelisse mantle. This was a double breasted sleeved unfitted coat with wide flat collar and a reversed cuff. Mantle. A floor length coat fitted to waist in front full at the back with either long loose sleeves or full shawl like sleeves cut as part of mantle. Shawl mantle, this was a loose cloak reaching to the skirt hemline. The talma mantle is a full cloak with tasseled hood for a flat or a flat collar. Rotonde is a short version of the talma mantle and burnous is a hooded cape. Zouave, this was a short collarless jacket trimmed with braid and worn over a Garibaldi shirt. Women parted their hair in the center and drew it over the ears, smoothly or in waves, and then into a bun or plates at the back of the head. For evenings, curls were arranged at the back of the neck. Snood was a net used to confine the hair. Day caps with long lappets or ribbons were worn by married and older women. Bonnets and hats with small crowns and wide brims were worn. Bergeray straw hats, pork pie and sailor hats with low round crowns and small brims turned up at one side. Beaded hairnets, lace, handkerchiefs, ornaments made of flowers or fruits, jeweled ornaments for evening were also worn. For footwear, white silk and cotton stockings were worn. Also colored and plaid stockings were worn. Most shoes worn in daytime had square toes and low heels. Some styles had rosettes trimming over the toe. For evenings, shoes were made of white kid or satin. Evening shoes were often colored to match the gown. Boots were cut above the ankle and closed with lacing, buttons or with elastic sides. Gloves were short and fitted for daytime sporty gauntlets with white cuffs and elbow covering gloves for evening. Fingerless smiths, often of lace, were worn for day or evening. Handkerchiefs, folding fans, small muffs, parasols, Swiss belt, bracelets, earrings, brooches, necklaces were all worn. Men wore underdrawers that were long or short. Undervests was part of the underwear. Shirts remained the same. White was the predominant color. Colored shirts were worn in the country or during sporting events. Ruffles and tucking at the front of the shirt was used only for evenings. Ties and cravats were used to wrap around the neck. Suits consisting of coat, waistcoat, shirt and trousers. Coats were not closed and were kept open, revealing the waistcoat underneath. Tailcoats became an evening coat and sometimes had velvet lapels. Frock coats became slightly looser and were worn for daytime activities. Morning coats, sack jackets that had straight fronts, center vents in the back, sleeves without cuffs and small collars with short lapels, or lounge coat, a loose comfortable jacket without a waistline, were worn. Reefers or pea jackets were loose double breasted with side vents and small collars. Waistcoats in the daytime ended above the natural waist and were single and double breasted. Waistcoats for evening were longer and always single breasted. Trousers became wider at the hemline and were made in striped and checked fabrics as well. Suspenders were used to hold the trouser in place. Knickerbockers, a sportswear garment, was cut with loose legs and belted into a band that buckled just below the knee. This later became knickers. Dressing gowns were made in decorative fabrics and were worn with nightcaps. Smoking jackets were loose jackets made in velvet, cashmere or other decorative fabrics with a tasseled cap. For outdoors, the Chesterfield frock overcoat, Inverness cape and a raglan cape was worn. Men wore their hair short, either curly or waved with top hats. Long full side whiskers were stylish. Moustaches also became popular. Other hats were a low crowned and wide brim made of felt or straw, the derbies or bowlers that were flat crowns and narrow brims, the Stetson hat, 
this originated in this period in America. Also worn were laced shoes, half or short boots with elastic sides or buttoned or laced closings and long boots. Short or long gaiters or spatterdashers were added to shoes for sportswear. Men carried canes, umbrellas with decorative handles and wore gloves. They carried watches, watch chains, pins, rings and a variety of ornamental buttons and studs. Finally, let's look at the bustle period and the 90s. The aesthetic movement was an attempt to reform the art of England and this had an impact on clothing styles as well. Art Nouveau was an attempt to create a completely new style of art with no roots in the past. The main sources of evidence for costumes during this period are costumes that have survived. Photographs, fashion printed magazines and paintings. For women, new back fullness was achieved through attachment of a bustle. Combination was the combining of a chemise and drawers for convenience. Tea gowns were worn without corsets, intended to offer relief to women from tight lacing. These garments were also viewed as rational or reform garments. Other items worn for the day were wrappers, dressing sacks, comb combing mantles and breakfast jackets. Separates, bodice and princess dresses were worn. Norfolk jackets with skirts. The princess polonaise, when a princess style over a dress was worn with a separate skirt and then looped up or draped over the hip. Daytime and evening dresses were similar in silhouette, only the fabric, ornamentation and trimmings varied. Ulster was a long belted coat made with a removable shoulder cape. Hair was parted in the centre, waved around the face and pulled into the back of the head. Long hair was arranged in large braids, chignon or long curls cascading down the back of the head. As the silhouette became narrower, even the hair became more confined in buns and curls. High boned collars were worn and hair was taken off the neck and placed high on the top. Hats and bonnets were exceedingly elaborate with ribbons, feathers, lace, flowers, flounces as trimmings. Stockings matched the colour of the dress, embroidery and stripe patterns were popular. Shoes and boots had pointed toes and medium high heels. Boots were less fashionable, calf length and closed with laces. Rubber soled shoes were worn for sports like tennis, boating and boots were worn for hiking and skating. Glove lengths varied with sleeve, sleeve lengths. Fans included gauze material, hand painted or large ostrich plumes mounted on turtle shells or ivory sticks. Parasols were large and had ornate handles, long points and were trimmed with lace and ribbons. For jewellery, bracelets, earrings, necklaces and hair ornaments were worn for evening and brooches for daytime. Makeup was unacceptable in polite society but cosmetics like cream, beauty soups and fragrances were popular. In the 90s, women wore underwear that was largely trimmed with lace, ribbons and embroideries. Corset underwent a change in that they started below the bust and ended at the waist. The corset covers came to be called camisoles. Although the bustle was removed, the skirts continued to have a full hourglass silhouette achieved through gathers and pleats. Shoulder constructions included yokes or revers with width at the shoulder produced by ruffles or frills. Sleeves became large at the shoulder and narrow at the wrist like the Lego mutton sleeve. Most skirts were gored, fitting smoothly over the hips. Sometimes the backs had pleats or gathers. Skirts also had buckram, lining at the hemline, to give a stiffer, fuller fall. Although skirts were worn for sporting activities, slightly shorter skirts were worn. Blouses were called shirt waists and later nicknamed waists. These were one of the first mass-produced garments for women. The Gibson girl look became very famous. Tailor-made garments were made by tailors as opposed to dressmakers who had earlier made clothing for women. Evening dresses had low necklines and were either V, square or round shaped. Off the shoulder lines were common. These gowns had full sleeves ending above or at elbow 
and were usually large and balloon shaped. Evening dresses often had trains. Capes with high puffs were most common outdoor garments. Knickers were worn for sporting activities like cycling and swimming. Women wore their hair in a curled fringe at the front and twisted and arranged the rest of the hair in a coil or curl at the top. The Gibson girl favoured an arrangement with deep soft waves around the face. Hats were only worn out of doors. They were small to medium in size and some had no brim. For sports and work, men and women wore the fedora and the straw boater. For evenings, hair decorations like feathers, combs, jewelled ornaments were worn. Shoes had slightly rounded toes, medium high heels. Boots either laced or buttoned up. During the period 1870 to 1900, men wore drawers. They closed at the front with a button fly and a drawstring was used to adjust the waist. These drawers could be ankle length when worn under the trousers and knee length when worn for sports. Under vests or under shirts were hip length and had long sleeves. Union suits combined the drawers and undershirts. Frock coats were still worn. Morning coats, sack coats or lounge coats continued in fashion though the waist seam was no longer seen. The Norfolk jacket was a belted sports jacket. Trousers were straight and fairly narrow though daytime trousers were fairly wide. Knickerbockers were worn for golf, hiking, tennis and shooting. They were paired with stocking and sturdy shoes or boots and gaiters. Coats tended to be buttoned high up on the chest and therefore waistcoats became less important. Shirts had a stiff front for formal wear. Standing collars became stiffer and wider. Removable starch collars were common. Bow ties were popular and longer ties were knotted. Fancy coloured and striped shirts were first introduced in this period. Tailcoats were worn for the evenings. A continuous rolled collar faced in satin replaced the notched collar. Evening waistcoats matched the rest of the suit and were usually double-breasted. Collars fit closely and narrow bow ties were fashionable during evenings. The dress version of the sack suit was introduced. It was called the tuxedo. The Inverness overcoat and ulcer coat were one of the many long coats worn for outdoors. Men kept their hair short, used a side or centre part. Moustaches were popular, worn with side whiskers or a beard. Later, the clean-shaven look was in trend. Top hats, fedoras, homburgs and caps for sports were worn. Straw boaters and deerstalker cap, made famous by the illustrated Sherlock Holmes stories, were worn. Patent leather shoes were used for both day and night. They laced up at the front. Elastic-sided shoes, sturdy high shoes for work or hunting, Oxford and gymnastic shoes of canvas or calf with rubber soles were popular. Men wore gloves, tie pins, watches, shirt studs and cufflinks and used walking sticks. You have come to the end of this unit. To summarize, in this unit you have learned about early modern history and the impact that it had on clothing. Thank you.